Section 1 of The Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte, translated by Jane Sinnott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Doubt the aim of my being at last then i may hope that i am tolerably well acquainted with the world that surrounds me in the unanimous declaration of my senses in unfailing experience alone have i placed my trust what i have beheld i have touched what i have touched i have analyzed i have repeated my observations again and again I have compared the various phenomena together, and only when I could perceive their connection, when I could explain and deduce one from the other, and foresee the result, and that the result was such as to justify my calculations, have I been satisfied. Therefore am I now as well assured of the accuracy of this part of my knowledge as of my own existence. I walk with a firm step in this my world, and would stake welfare and life itself on the infallibility of my convictions. But what then am I, and what is the aim and end of my being? The question is superfluous. It is long since I have been made well acquainted with these points, and it would take much time to recapitulate all that I have heard, learnt, and believed concerning them and by what means then have i attained this knowledge which i have this confused notion of possessing have i urged on by a burning desire of knowledge toiled on through uncertainty and doubt and contradiction have i when anything appeared credible examined and sifted and compared till an inward voice proclaimed irresistibly and without a possibility of mistake thus it is as surely as thou livest no i can remember no such state of mind those instructions were bestowed on me before i desired them the answers were given before the questions were proposed i heard for i could not avoid doing so and much of what i heard remained in my memory but without examination and without interest i allowed everything to take its place as chance directed how then could i persuade myself that if i really possessed any knowledge upon these points if i can only be said to know that of which i am convinced and which i have wrought out myself experienced i cannot truly say that i know anything at all of the aim and end of my being i know merely what others profess to know and all that i can really be assured of is that i have heard them speak so and so upon these things whilst then i have inquired into and examined for myself with the most anxious care comparatively trivial matters in things of the highest import i have relied wholly on the care and fidelity of others i have attributed to others an interest in the highest affairs of humanity an earnestness and accuracy which i by no means discover in myself i have regarded them as indescribably superior to me whatever of truth they really possess they can have attained by no other means than by their own meditations and why may not i by the same means attain the same ends how much have i undervalued and degraded myself it shall be no longer thus from this moment i will enter on my rights on the dignity to which i have a claim let all that is foreign to my own mind be at once renounced i will examine for myself it may be that secret wishes concerning the termination of my inquiries that a partial inclination towards certain conclusions will awaken in my heart i will forget and deny these wishes 
and allow them no influence in the direction of my thoughts. I will go to work with scrupulous severity. What I find to be truth shall be welcome to me, let it sound as it may. I will know with the same certainty with which I can calculate that this ground will bear me when I tread on it, that this fire will burn me if I approach too near it. Will I know what I am and what I shall be? And should this not be possible, thus much at least will I know that it is not possible. Even to this result will I submit if it should present itself to me as truth. I hasten towards the fulfillment of my task. I seize on nature as she hastens ever onward in her flight, detain her for an instant, and contemplate steadily the present moment. This nature on which my thinking powers have been developed, and for which the conclusions valid in her domain have been formed. I am surrounded by objects which I am compelled to regard as wholes, subsisting for themselves and separately from each other i behold plants trees and animals i ascribe to each individual certain signs and attributes by which i distinguish it from others to this plant such a form to another another to this tree such and such leaves to another others differing from them every object has its appointed number of attributes neither more nor less to every question whether it is this or that is for any one acquainted with it a decisive yes or no possible everything that is is something or it is not has a certain color or has it not is tangible or is not and so on every object possesses its properties in an appointed degree which it neither exceeds nor falls short of Everything that is, is definite, determined, is some one thing, and is not something else. Not that I am unable to conceive an object hovering between opposite limitations. I am certainly able to do this, for half of my thoughts consist of such. I think of a tree in general. Has this tree leaves or not, fruit or not, and if so, in what quantities? To what species does it belong? How large is it? All these questions must remain unanswered, for my thought is undetermined, and does not represent any particular tree, but a tree in general, and it has no real existence, for whatever really exists has its appointed number of all its possible attributes, and each of these in its appointed measure although I may never be able to comprehend all the properties of any one object or to apply to them any standard. Nature, however, hastens on through her everlasting transformations, and while I am speaking of the present moment, it is gone, and all is changed. In the same manner, the moment before my observation, all was otherwise. It had not always been as I found it. It had become so why then and from what cause had it become what it was why had nature amidst the manifold infinite possible varieties of being assumed precisely these and no others for this reason that certain others had preceded them and these in the same manner will determine those which shall follow and these again others to infinity were the smallest thing at the present moment different from what it is then necessarily in the following moment would something else be different and again in the succeeding one and so on for ever nature in her never ceasing changes follows steadily certain undeviating laws I find myself in a close chain of phenomena in which every link depends on that which has preceded it, so that if at any moment I could be made acquainted with all existing conditions of the universe, I should be able to declare what they had been in the preceding moment and what they would be in that which was to follow. In every part I find the whole. 
for every part only by means of the whole has become what it is what i have discovered then i find amounts to this that to every existence another must be presupposed to every condition another preceding condition let me pause a little here for it may happen that on my clear insight into this point may depend much of the success of my future inquiry why and from what cause i had asked are the modifications of objects precisely such as i find them to be assuming thus without a moment's hesitation and without proof as an absolute and certain truth that they had a cause that not by themselves but by something beyond them they had obtained existence and reality i had found myself compelled to assume another existence as a necessary condition of theirs but why then did i find their existence insufficient to itself incomplete what betrayed to me a want in them this without doubt that in the first place these qualities or attributes do not exist in and for themselves they are forms of something formed modifications of something modified and the conception of what in the language of the schools has been called a substratum a something capable of receiving and supporting the attributes must be always added to them further that to such a substratum a certain quality is attributed supposes a condition of repose and cessation from change otherwise there could be no determinate modification but merely a passing from one state to another a state of mere passivity is an incomplete existence some activity is necessary to form what may be called the basis of the suffering what i found myself compelled to suppose was by no means that in the successive changes which nature undergoes one brings forth the other that the present modification annihilates itself and in the next moment when it no longer exists produces another to occupy its place the modification produces neither itself nor anything out of itself what i found myself compelled to assume was an active force peculiar to the object to account for the gradual origin and the changes of those modifications and what then do i conceive to be the nature or essence of this power and the modes of its manifestation i know no more than this that it is capable under certain conditions of producing certainly and infallibly a determinative effect and no other the principle of activity of arising and becoming is certainly in itself as surely as it is a force it is capable of setting itself in motion the cause of its having developed itself in a certain manner lies partly in itself as it is a force and partly in the circumstances under which it develops itself both these the inward determination of a force from itself and the external by circumstances must be united to produce a given change every force so far as i can conceive of one must be determinate but its determination is completed by the circumstances under which it is developed a force exists in my conception only so far as i can perceive its working an inactive force is entirely inconceivable i see a flower that has sprung out of the earth and i conclude that a formative power exists in nature such a formative power exists for me only so far as this flower and others and plants and animals exist i can describe this power merely by its effect and it exists for me no further than as producing flowers and plants animals and other organic forms I will go further and maintain that a flower and precisely this flower could exist in this place only so far as all circumstances united to make it possible but that by the union of all these circumstances for its possibility 
the real existence of the flower is by no means explained to me and for this i am compelled to assume a peculiar original power in nature and precisely a flower producing power for another power of nature under the same circumstances might have produced something entirely different when i contemplate all things as one whole i perceive one nature one force when i regard them as individuals many forces which develop themselves according to their inward laws and pass through all the forms of which they are capable and all the objects in nature are but these forces under certain limitations every manifestation of every individual power of nature is determined partly by itself partly by its own preceding manifestations and partly by the manifestations of all the other powers of nature with which it is connected but it is connected with all for nature is one connected whole its manifestations are therefore strictly necessary and it is absolutely impossible that it should be other than what it is in every moment of her duration nature is one connected whole in every moment must every individual part be what it is because all others are what they are and a single grain of sand could not be moved from its place without however imperceptibly to us changing something throughout all parts of the immeasurable whole every moment of duration is determined by all past moments and will determine all future moments and even the position of a grain of sand cannot be conceived other than it is without supposing other changes to an indefinite extent let us imagine for instance this grain of sand lying some few feet further inland than it actually does then must the storm wind that drove it in from the seashore have been stronger than it actually was then must the preceding state of the atmosphere by which this wind was occasioned and its degree of strength determined have been different from what it actually was and the previous changes which gave rise to this particular weather and so on we must suppose a different temperature from that which really existed a different constitution of the bodies which influenced this temperature the fertility or barrenness of countries the duration of the life of man depend unquestionably in a great degree upon temperature how can we know since it is not given us to penetrate the arcana of nature and it is therefore allowable to speak of possibilities how can we know that in such a state of the weather as we have been supposing in order to carry this grain of sand a few yards further some ancestor of yours might not have perished from hunger or cold or heat long before the birth of that son from whom you are descended and thus you might never have been at all and all that you have ever done and all that you ever hope to do in this world must have been hindered in order that a grain of sand might lie in a different place end of section one section two of the destination of man by johann gottlieb fichte translated by jane sinnett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter two doubt chain of rigid natural necessity i myself with all that i call mine am but a link in this chain of rigid natural necessity there was a time so others tell me and although i am not immediately conscious of it i am compelled by reason to admit it as a truth there was a time in which i was not and a moment in which i began to be i then only existed for others not yet for myself since then myself my conscious being 
has gradually developed itself and i have discovered in myself certain faculties and capacities wants and natural desires i am a definite creature which came into existence at a certain time i have not come into existence by my own power it would be the highest absurdity to suppose that before i was at all i could bring myself into existence i have then been called into being by a power out of myself and what should this be but the universal power of nature of which i form a part the time at which my existence commenced and the attributes belonging to me were determined by this universal power of nature and all the forms under which these my inborn attributes have since manifested themselves have been determined by the self-same power it was impossible that instead of me another should have arisen it is impossible that at any moment of my existence i should be other than what i am that my successive states of being have been accompanied by consciousness that some of them such as thoughts resolutions and the like appear to be nothing but various modifications of consciousness need not perplex my reasonings it is the nature of the plant regularly to develop itself of the animal to move towards the attainment of certain ends of man to think why should i hesitate to acknowledge the latter as an original power of nature as well as the first and second nothing could prevent me from doing so but the astonishment i feel at such a conclusion thought is assuredly a far higher and more subtle operation of nature than the formation of a plant or the motion of an animal i cannot explain how the power of nature can produce thought but can i better explain its operation in the production of a plant in the motion of an animal to attempt to deduce thought from any mere organization of matter is an extravagance into which i shall not easily fall but can i then explain from it the formation of the simplest moss those original powers of nature cannot be explained for it is only through them that we can explain anything thought exists in nature as well as the creative power which gives birth to the plant the thinking being arises and develops itself by natural laws and exists through nature there is therefore in nature an original thinking power as well as an original plant creating power this original thinking power advances and develops itself through all the modifications of which it is capable as the other original forces of nature assume all possible forms i like the plant am a particular manifestation of the formative power like the animal a particular manifestation of the power of motion and in addition to these a particular manifestation of the thinking power and it is the union of these three original forces in one harmonious development that makes the distinguishing characteristic of any species as it is the distinguishing characteristic of the plant species to be merely a manifestation of the plant forming power figure motion thought in me are not consequent on one another but are the simultaneous and harmonious developments of what might be called the man forming power necessarily manifest in itself in a creature of my species i am not what i am because i think so or will so nor do i think and will because i am but i am and i think both absolutely as certainly as those original powers of nature exist for themselves and have their own internal laws and purposes so certainly must their manifestations in the world of reality if left to themselves and not subjected to any foreign force endure for a certain period of time and pass through a certain series of changes that which should vanish at the moment of its production could not be the expression or manifestation of an original power but only an effect of the combined operation of various powers 
the plant when left to itself proceeds from the first germination to the ripening of the seed man a particular manifestation of all the powers of nature in their union when left to himself no accident intervening proceeds from birth to death in old age hence the duration of the life of man and of plants and the various modifications of this their life this form this motion this thought this duration of all essential qualities amidst many non-essential changes belong to me as to a being of my species but this man-forming power in nature had displayed itself before the commencement of my existence under various conditions and circumstances these external circumstances have determined the particular mode of their present operation in the production of precisely such an individual of my species as i am the same circumstances can never recur or the whole of nature must retrograde the same individuals can never again receive reality further the man forming power of nature has manifested itself at the time of my production under manifold conditions and circumstances no combination of circumstances can perfectly resemble those under which i received existence and unless the universe could be divided into two similar but unconnected worlds two perfectly similar individuals cannot be produced by these conditions and circumstances it was determined that this definite person i should become and the laws by which i am that which i am are universal i am that which i am because in the connection of the great whole only such a one and absolutely no other was possible and a spirit who could look through all nature would from the knowledge of a single man be able to determine what men had been before and what they would be at any moment in one person he would obtain the knowledge of all this my connection with the whole of nature it is then which determines what i have been what i am and what i shall be the same spirit would be able at any moment of my existence to form infallible conclusions on what i had hitherto been and what i was to be all that i am and shall be i am and shall be of necessity and it is impossible that i should be otherwise i do indeed feel an inward consciousness of independence of having on many occasions in my life exerted a free agency but this consciousness may easily be explained on the principles already laid down and is perfectly reconcilable with the conclusions i have drawn my immediate consciousness my absolute perception cannot go beyond myself i have immediate knowledge only of myself whatever i know further i know only by reasoning in the same manner in which i have come to those conclusions concerning the original powers of nature which certainly do not lie within the circle of my perceptions i however that which i call myself am not the man forming power of nature but only one of its manifestations and only of this manifestation am i conscious not of that power whose existence i have only discovered from the necessity of explaining my own this manifestation however is certainly the production of an original and independent force and must appear as such in my consciousness for this reason do i appear to myself as a free agent in those occurrences of my life in which the independent force falling to my share as an individual manifests itself without hindrance but as subject to constraint when by any combination of circumstances beyond the limits of my individuality i cannot do what i might otherwise be capable of doing when my individual force by the excess of antagonist forces is compelled to manifest itself otherwise than in accordance with its own laws 
bestow consciousness on a tree and let it freely grow and spread out its branches and bring forth leaves and buds and blossoms and fruits after its kind it will be aware of no limits to its existence in being only a tree and a tree of a certain species and an individual of that species it will feel itself free because in all those manifestations it will act according to its nature it can will nothing more than what that nature requires but let unfavorable weather insufficient nourishment or other causes hinder its growth and it will feel itself confined restrained because an impulse of its nature cannot be satisfied bind its free waving branches to a wall force foreign branches on it by grafting and it will feel itself constrained it will grow but in a direction different from that of its own nature it will produce fruit but not such as it would of itself have brought forth in my immediate consciousness i appear to myself as free by meditation on the whole of nature i discover that freedom is impossible the former must be subordinate to the latter for it is only to be explained through it end of section two section three of the destination of man by johann gottlieb fichte translated by jane sinnott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter three doubt i call it mine with what satisfaction do i now survey the system which my understanding has built up what order what firm connection do i find in the whole of my knowledge how easy is it to survey its extent consciousness is no longer that anomaly in nature whose relation to existence is so incomprehensible it is native to it one of the necessary manifestations nature rises gradually in the definite series of her productions in unorganized matter she is a simple existence in the plant and the animal she turns back to operate internally on herself to produce form and motion in man as her highest masterpiece she perceives and contemplates herself and becomes twofold existence and consciousness in one what i know of my own existence and of its limitations is easy to explain my existence and my knowledge have one common foundation in nature my existence must necessarily be aware of itself for therefore do i call it mine and my recognition of corporeal objects without myself is equally comprehensible the forces in whose manifestation my personality consists the formative the moving the thinking powers exist not through all nature but only within definite limits by the limitation of my own being i perceive other existences which are not me of the first i am immediately conscious and the knowledge of the latter is its necessary consequence away then with those imaginary influences and operations of external things upon me by means of which they are supposed to force upon me a knowledge which is not in and cannot proceed out of them the foundation of my belief in the existence of an external world lies in myself and not in it in the limitations of my own being by means of these limitations the thinking principle in me proceeds out of herself and obtains a knowledge of the whole but every individual regards it from a different point of view in this manner i obtain the idea of other thinking beings like myself i or the thinking power within me become aware of some thoughts which have developed themselves from within and of others 
which, not having so developed themselves, lead me to infer the existence of other thinking beings like myself. Nature in me is conscious of the whole of herself, but only thus, that beginning with individual consciousness, she proceeds to the consciousness of universal being by explanation according to the law of causality. The law of causality affords a point of transition from the particular within myself to the universal, which lies beyond the limits of my being, and the distinguishing characteristic of these two kinds of knowledge is that one is the immediate result of contemplation, the other of reasoning. In each individual, nature beholds herself from a different point of view. I lie beyond thee, as thou beyond me. From our several points we describe various paths which may here and there intersect each other, but never run parallel. In the consciousness of all individuals taken together consists the complete consciousness of the universe, and there is no other for only in the individual is limitation and reality. The declaration of the consciousness of every individual is infallible, if it be the consciousness hitherto described, for this consciousness develops itself out of the whole course of the laws of nature. Nature cannot contradict herself. Wherever there is a conception, there must be a correlative existence for conceptions are produced simultaneously with their correlatives. To every individual is his particular consciousness determinate, for it proceeds from his nature. No one can have another kind or degree of it than he actually has. The substance of his knowledge is determined by the place which he occupies in the universe its clearness and vividness by the higher or lower degree of efficacy manifested by the force of humanity in his person. Give to nature a single definition of a person. Let it be ever so apparently trivial, the course of a muscle, the turn of a hair. She would be able, had she a universal consciousness, to declare what would be his whole course of thought during his whole course of being. According to this system also, it is easy to comprehend the phenomenon of our consciousness called the will. Will is the immediate consciousness of the activity of the inward powers of our nature, the immediate consciousness of an effort and aspiration of these powers which is not yet activity because restrained by opposing forces, this is inclination or desire. The struggle of contending forces is irresolution. The victory of one is the resolution of the will. Should the force striving after activity be one that we have in common with the plant or the animal, there arises a discord and degradation of our inward being. The desire is not suitable to our rank in the order of things, and according to a common expression may be called a low one. Should it comprehend our whole undivided humanity, it is suitable to our nature and may be called a moral law. The activity of this latter is a virtuous will, and the actions resulting from it are virtue. Whichever of these forces should obtain the victory, obtains it of necessity. Its superiority is determined by the whole connection of the universe. By the same connection also is the want of virtue or the vice of each individual irrevocably determined. But notwithstanding this, virtue is still virtue and vice, vice. The virtuous man is still a noble, excellent production of nature. The vicious, an ignoble and contemptible one but both are equally creatures of necessity. There is indeed such a feeling as remorse, the consciousness of the continued aspiration of humanity in me, even after it has been overcome, a disquieting but still costly pledge of our noble nature.
from this consciousness arises the conscience and its greater or less susceptibility down to its absolute defection in various individuals an ignoble nature is not capable of repentance for the force of humanity in him is not capable of contending with the lower impulses reward and punishment are the natural consequences of virtue and vice for the production of new virtue and new vice by frequent and important victories the peculiar force is strengthened and extended by inactivity or frequent defeat it becomes weaker and weaker the ideas of guilt of imputed transgression have no meaning but what relates to the laws of society he only is guilty who compels society to employ an artificial external force to restrain in him the impulses which would be injurious to the general welfare End of section three. Section four of the Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte, translated by Jane Sinnott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4. Doubt. Inquiry is closed. My inquiry is closed, and my desire of knowledge satisfied. I know what I am, and wherein consists the nature of my species. I am a manifestation of a self-determining power of nature whose operation is determined by the whole of the universe. It is impossible for me to obtain an insight into my individual being in its foundations, for I cannot penetrate into the interior of nature. But I have an immediate consciousness of what I am at the present moment. I can mostly remember what I have been, and I shall learn in due time what I shall be. This discovery can indeed be of no use to me in the regulation of my actions, for I do not truly act at all. Nature acts in me, and to make myself other than what nature has made me is totally out of my power. I may repent and rejoice and form good resolutions, although strictly speaking i cannot even do this for all these things come to me of themselves when it is appointed for them to do so most certainly i cannot by all my repentance by all my resolutions produce the smallest alteration in the appointed course of things i stand under the inexorable power of rigid necessity should she have destined me to become a fool and a profligate a fool and a profligate without doubt i shall become should she have destined me to be wise and good wise and good i shall doubtless be there is neither merit nor blame to be ascribed to her or to me she stands under her own laws i under hers it would therefore contribute to my tranquillity to subject even my wishes to that power to which my existence is entirely subject. Oh, these rebellious wishes! For why should I longer conceal from myself the melancholy, the aversion, the horror which seized me when I saw how my inquiry must end? I had solemnly promised myself that my inclinations should have no influence on the course of my reflections, and as far as I am aware, I have really allowed them none. But may I not confess that this result contradicts the deepest wants, wishes, and aspirations of my nature? and how in spite of its apparent accuracy and the cutting sharpness of the proofs by which it seems to be supported 
can i truly believe in an explanation of my nature which destroys every hope for which i wish to live and without which i should curse my existence why should my heart mourn at all and be lacerated by that which so perfectly satisfies my understanding when nothing in nature contradicts itself is the life of man only a perpetual contradiction or perhaps not the life of man in general but only of me and of those who resemble me had i but remained content in the pleasant delusions that surround me been satisfied with the consciousness of my existence without those anxious questionings whose solution has made me miserable but if this solution be the true one i could do no otherwise than i have done i did not raise these difficulties but the thinking nature within me raised them i was destined to this misery and i mourn in vain the innocent unconsciousness which is lost to me for ever but let me take courage should i lose all else let that never forsake me merely for the sake of my wishes did they appear ever so sacred or did they lie ever so deep in my heart i cannot renounce what appears to rest on irrefragable proofs but i may perhaps have erred in my investigation i may have taken but a one-sided or too narrow view of the question i should begin the inquiry again from the opposite point what is it that i find so revolting in the decision to which i have come to what did my wishes point let me before all things make clear to myself what are the inclinations to which i appeal that i should by necessity be either wise or good or foolish or vicious without having in one case or the other merit or fault this it was that filled me with aversion and horror the determination of my actions by a cause out of myself whose manifestations were again determined by other causes this it was from which i so violently revolted the freedom which was not mine but that of a foreign power and in that only a conditional half-freedom this it was with which i could not rest satisfied i myself that which in this system only appears as the manifestation of a higher existence i will be independent will be something not by another or through another but of myself the rank in which that system is assumed by an original power of nature i will myself occupy and with this difference that the modes of my manifestations shall not be limited by any foreign powers i will have an inward force a peculiar capacity of manifold infinite manifestation like those powers of nature but whose movements shall not be like theirs limited or defined by external conditions what then according to my wish shall be the seat and centre of this peculiar inward force not my body evidently for that i willingly allow to pass for a manifestation of the powers of nature not my sensual inclinations for these i regard as the relations of these powers to my consciousness my capacities of thought and of volition then nothing will content me but absolute freedom of the will by means of which i may act on and mould and move first my own frame and through it the world surrounding me my active natural powers shall be subordinate to my will and absolutely set in motion by no other force i will have freedom to seek a supreme spiritual good and a capacity to recognize it and if i do not find it the fault shall be mine my actions shall be the immediate result of my own will and of no other power whatever the powers of my mind and body determined and subject to the dominion of my will 
shall operate on the external world i will be the lord of nature and she shall be my servant i will influence her according to the measure of my capacity but she shall have no influence on me these then are my wishes and aspirations and they are wholly denied and contradicted by a system that has nevertheless satisfied my understanding instead of being independent of nature and of any spiritual law not self-imposed i am merely a definite link in her mighty chain if such a freedom as i have described be at all conceivable it is possible that a more complete and thorough investigation may discover it to me and compel me to receive it as a reality and to ascribe it to myself so as to afford an entire refutation of my former conclusions this is now the question i will be free in the sense stated i will make myself whatever i shall be i must then and herein lies the difficulty and indeed at first sight the absurdity of the idea i must already be in a certain sense that which i would become in order to become so i must possess a twofold being of which the first shall contain the fundamental determining principle of the second if i interrogate my consciousness i find that i have the knowledge of various possibilities of action from amongst which as it appears to me i can choose any one i run through the whole circle enlarge it compare one with the other and at length decide on one and this resolution of my will is followed by a corresponding action here then certainly i am in thought what subsequently by means of this thought i am in will and in action i am as a thinking what i afterwards am as an active being i have determined my existence in reality by my thought and my thought absolutely by previous thought one can conceive of any certain state of a mere manifestation of one of the powers of nature of a plant for instance as preceded by another intermediate state in which left to itself it might have assumed any one of an infinite variety of possible manifestations these manifold possibilities certainly exist in it but not for it since it is not capable of the idea and cannot choose or of itself put an end to this state of indecision this must be affected by an external cause which will determine it to one or other of these various possibilities this possible determination can have no previous existence in thought for the plant is capable of only one mode that of real existence in maintaining formerly that the manifestation of every force must receive its complete determination from without i took cognizance without doubt only of such as are incapable of consciousness and have merely an existence in the phenomenal world of them the above assertion holds true without the slightest limitation with respect to intelligences the grounds of this assertion are not admissible and it appears therefore over hasty to extend it to them freedom such as i have described is conceivable only of intelligence but under its assumption man as well as nature is perfectly comprehensible my corporeal frame and my capacity of operating on the world of sense are as in the former system manifestations of certain powers existing in nature and my natural inclinations are the relations of these manifestations to my consciousness the mere cognition of what exists independently of me arises under this supposition of freedom as well as in the former system and so far both agree but here begins the contradiction under the former system my capacity of sensuous activity remains under the dominion of nature and it is set in motion by the same power which produced it 
and thought has no other affair than that of looking on according to the present system this capacity when once produced falls under the dominion of a power above nature and entirely superior to her laws the office of thought is no longer merely to contemplate but to set in motion this capacity in the one case forces to me external and invisible put an end to my state of indecision and limit my capacity and my consciousness of it that is to say my will to a certain point exactly as in the plant in the other i find myself free and independent of the influence of all external forces putting a voluntary end to the state of indecision and determining my own action according to the degree of knowledge i may have attained of what appears best which of these two opinions shall i adopt am i a free agent or am i merely the manifestation of a foreign power neither appear sufficiently well founded for the first there is nothing more to be said than that it is conceivable in the latter i extend a proposition perfectly valid on its own ground further than it can properly reach if intelligences are indeed merely manifestations of a certain power of nature i do quite right to extend this proposition to them the question is only whether they really are such and it shall be solved by reasoning from other premises not however from a one-sided answer assumed at the very commencement of the inquiry in which i deduce no more from the proposition than i have previously placed in it there does not seem to be sufficient proof of either of these two positions the case cannot be decided by immediate consciousness i can never become conscious either of the external forces which in the system of universal necessity determine my actions nor of my own individual power by which under the supposition of free agency i determine myself whichever of the two systems i shall adopt it appears that i must do so without sufficient proof the system of freedom satisfies the opposite one kills annihilates the feeling of my heart to stand by cold and passive amidst the vicissitudes of events a mere mirror to reflect the fugitive forms of objects floating by such an existence as this is insupportable to me i despise and renounce it i will love I will lose myself in sympathy for another. I am to myself even an object of the highest sympathy, which can be satisfied only by my actions. I will rejoice and I will mourn. I will rejoice when I have done what I call right. I will lament when I have done wrong. And even this sorrow shall be dear to me for it will be a pledge of future amendment. In love only is life, without it is death and annihilation. Coldly and insolently does the opposite system advance and turn this love into a mockery, the object of my deepest attachment into a delusion, a cobweb of the brain. It is not I, but a foreign and to me unknown power that acts in me i stand abashed with my affections of the heart and my virtuous will and blush for what is best and purest in my nature for the sake of which alone i wish to be at all as for an absurdity and a folly what is holiest in me has become a prey for scorn it was without doubt my interest in these feelings and affections which induced me although unconsciously in the commencement of the inquiry which has driven me to despair to regard myself at once as free and independent and it was also this interest which has led me to carry out even to conviction an opinion which has nothing in its favor but its possibility and the impossibility of proving the contrary 
it was this which had hitherto restrained me from this undertaking from the attempt to explain my own nature and existence the opposite system barren and heartless indeed but inexhaustible in explanation will explain also this wish for freedom and this aversion to the contrary supposition it explains all my objections drawn from my own consciousness and as often as i say i find thus and thus it replies with the same horrible calmness that i say also and more than that i will explain why it is of necessity thus thou standest will it answer to my complaints when thou speakest of thy heart thy love thy sympathy at the point of immediate consciousness of thine own being and thou hast confessed this already in asserting that thou art to thyself an object of the highest interest now it is already known and proved that this thou for which thou art so deeply interested where it is not an active force is at least an impulse of thy individual inward nature it is well known that every impulse reacts on itself and incites itself to action it is therefore conceivable how this impulse must manifest itself in a conscious being as love as aspiration after free individual efficacy couldst thou change thy narrow point of vision in self-consciousness for the higher one of the universe which thou hast promised thyself to take it would become clear to thee that what thou hast named thyself love is but the interest which the power manifesting itself in thee has to maintain itself in this manifestation do not then appeal again to thy self-love which if it should prove anything would merely prove that nature in thee was interested in her own preservation thou hast readily admitted that although in the plant there exists a peculiar instinct or impulse to grow and develop itself the activity of this impulse is defined and limited by forces lying beyond itself bestow for the moment consciousness upon the plant and it will contemplate with interest and self-love this its instinct of growth convince it by reasoning that this instinct is not able of itself to affect anything whatever but that the measure of its expression of itself is always determined by something out of itself and it will perhaps speak as thou hast spoken and behave in a manner that may be pardoned in a plant but by no means in thee who art unquestioningly a higher production of nature and capable of contemplating the universal whole what can i answer to this representation should i attempt to place myself in this much talked of universal point of vision doubtless i must blush and be silent it is therefore a question whether i shall do this or confine myself to the range of my own consciousness whether knowledge shall be subordinated to love or love to knowledge the one has but a bad reputation among people of understanding the other renders me indescribably miserable by annihilating myself in myself i cannot do the one without appearing in my own eyes to commit a folly nor the other without what seems a moral suicide the question cannot remain undecided for on its solution hangs the whole dignity and tranquillity of my existence i find it nevertheless impossible to decide and have absolutely no ground of decision for one opinion or the other intolerable state of uncertainty and irresolution by the most courageous resolve of my life am i reduced to this what power can save me from it from myself end of section four